rules of inference. So up to now, we've actually uh, learned the truth tables to um, test the validity of various argument forms. Now, what I'm going to go over now is the um, idea of how these argument forms are actually used to prove validity in other more complex arguments that actually combine the simple argument forms. To do this, what we're going to do is we're going to go over what we call rules of inference. Now, you've seen some of these rules of inference before, but they were just simply argument forms that we tested in truth tables. Once we've done the truth table, the idea is that we're able to use the validity of the proof, right, from the truth table to make assumptions or use these argument forms as axioms uh, to do more deductive proof. So I'm going to introduce you to nine basic argument forms, nine rules of inference. There are many more rules of inference, but uh, for this level of work, we're, well, I'm going to focus on these basic nine. So some of the ones that you discovered up to this point are modus ponens, the disjunctive syllogism, modus tollens, and the hypothetical syllogism. Now, let's go back over the idea of modus ponens. Modus ponens started off with the idea that P implies Q. Right? So if the, if P, then Q. If we have P, we therefore can assume that we have Q. Because we stated in the rule here that P leads to Q, if we have a P, naturally leads us to the idea that we have Q. All right, so that's how that argument form works. And you remember, if we look at the truth table, you remember the truth table form here, All right? P then Q, P then Q, and if we have P being true, and if P then Q is also true, then Q is also true. Remember, that was like row four of our, of our original truth table. And we knew that this was actually a valid argument form, right? Because in the end, right, we end up with Q, right? So the if then, if P then Q rule actually applies and works. So that's modus tollens. Modus tollens actually use the same implication, if you remember. So back in our previous lesson, again, we have if P then Q. This time, we had the idea that we don't have Q. Right, so if P then Q, not Q, therefore, right, we tested by the truth table. Right, remember the idea that we had P, Q, right, uh, P then Q, and uh, we said that this was a truthful rule. Right, so if P then Q was true, um, Q was false, we knew that from the truth table, right, so from our very first rule row, that two falses, right, still leads to the idea that this is true, right? Remember, the rule applies because, you know, if we have P, then we have Q. Well, since we didn't have P, right, it didn't matter whether we had Q or not, this was actually still a truthful statement. Not having the Q necessarily implies that we don't have the P as well. Because if we had the P, then we would have gotten the Q, right? So this is how modus tollens work. So our argument form, if P then Q, not Q, leads us to the conclusion that we don't have P, right? Not Q. So that was modus tollens. Now drawing back to our previous lesson again, looking at disjunctive syllogisms, you had this one. If you have P or Q. Right, P or Q. Um, if you don't have Q, therefore you must have P. Right. Remember the rule states here. Right? So again, the rule states here that if you have P or Q, one of them necessarily or both of them necessarily have to be the case that we have. To have. Otherwise, this rule doesn't actually work. So in this case. We don't have the Q, we necessarily assume that we have the P. Conversely, if we actually have if we actually have 
or Q. Right? And we don't have P. The same is true in the opposite way, right? That we that we necessarily have Q. Right? And also it works if we have both P and Q. So that's our disjunctive syllogism. Now from the last subset again, we had the hypothetical syllogism. We had if P then R, if R then Q. That necessarily led to the fact that if we have the P, we would naturally get the Q in the end. And that was the big, you know, eight row chart that we had uh, before, right? Proving that if P then Q necessarily had truthful statements of P then R, R then Q. So that's our hypothetical syllogism. We don't need to go through the truth tables again. I mean, I kind of did for a few of them here, but once you've done the truth table, you've proven the cases where it's valid. These argument forms are proven through those truth tables, right? So the idea that we've had that truth table for if P then Q, right? That basic implication, right? If P then Q, right? And you had all of those rows. I'll just do a quick look here. Right, the idea that you yeah, have P then Q, that was truthful. You have the P, you should get Q, in this case it's false, but this row is actually false. And of course these ones where you start off without the P meant the rule didn't apply, so of course these were all truthful as well. Now remember, based on this truth table, we could prove the argument forms for modus ponens and modus tollens by that truth table. So, of course, for modus ponens, we know that rule one is the application here. Right? Rule one actually tells us this is actually a valid argument. What's up? Modus tollens is also proven to be valid by looking at this row. Right? Looking at uh, at row four. So row four here actually proves the validity of modus tollens. So again, this truth table right here is actually proof for both of these particular cases, these two rules. Um, in our disjunctive syllogism, we could have done the same thing, did the P or Q, and then tested both argument forms for the disjunctive syllogism and shown those would have actually worked in, in those cases. And so the idea is once you've done the truth table, the truth table actually gives you that proof that proof of validity for any of these argument forms. So here are some of the rules and inference that we haven't actually gone over. Um, some of them are fairly simple ones. Um, we won't go through the truth tables for them all. We'll just give you the argument form. And you know, if you want to go through and do a truth table for them to test the validity, you can do so. Um, simplification. Here's one rule that says that if you have P, And we had Q. Alright, so the dot actually symbolizes and. If you have P and Q, the conclusion is, is that you have either one of these. Right? So if you have P and Q, naturally the conclusion is, is that you have P. Right? Otherwise that statement doesn't make any sort of sense. If you have P and Q, one of the other natural conclusions you can make is that you have Q. All right, so simplification is about the idea that if you have P and Q, or however many, you know, conjunctives that you want, that you necessarily conclude that you have those pieces, otherwise you don't have the conjunction, it doesn't work. So that's the idea of simplification. So you can actually simplify or break down this conjunctive into its various parts. The idea of addition states that if you have P, you can conclude that you have P or Q. And so the idea here is that uh, if you have one of these additive statements, that each individual part, you can add whatever other piece you want to it in the end, because the conclusion is, is that, right, remember back with the disjunctive syllogism, right, with the disjunction that you had P or Q, well, in the same way, you have to have one of the other parts here. In this case, you already started off with P. 
So it doesn't really, really matter whether you have Q or not. Um, it still makes this particular um, conjunction valid, or sorry, uh, disjunction valid. So you could put pretty much anything on the end. So if I had P, you know, I can make a conclusion that I have P or you know, R or Z or an orange. All right, we can get very silly with it. And so that's the rule of addition. The rule of conjunction states that if we have P and we have Q, we can conclude that we have P and Q. All right, so anytime you have various pieces that are in separate places, as long as they are stated to exist, in this case, we have stated that we have P, we have stated that we have Q, we naturally conclude that we have both. Right, E and Q, and you can actually combine them together in a single line. And that's the idea of conjunction. The next two are actually probably a little bit more complicated, uh, probably the most complicated ones you're going to get for our basic nine rules of inference. We'll start off with the destructive dilemma. The destructive dilemma states that if E then Q, and if R then S. If we have not Q or we have not S, we therefore end up with not Q or not R. Now this is all based on the idea before of modus tollens. Right? Remember modus tollens said that if you have an implication, as you see here, right? if you have the implication if P then Q, and you have the negation of the, and of the uh, consequent, that you necessarily have to deny the antecedent. Right? So if you don't have Q, the implication said that you should get Q if you had a P, we have to naturally assume that we don't have a P. Right, and so this idea, we can negate this idea that we have P. And so that's where this comes from, right? Not P basically is um, built out of the idea of modus tollens. Now in the second half, right, we have the not S. Again, through the idea of modus tollens from before, we plug in a not S into this statement up here. The idea is that if we don't have the S, we couldn't have possibly gotten the R from it before. And so, naturally, we have to assume that the case is that we don't have R. And in both cases, since we're actually doing a sort of conjunction of both of them, right, so we do a conjunction of both of these implications, right, if P then Q and not if R then, then S, then doing modus tollens on both of them would naturally conclude that we don't have either P or R in this case. So that's the destructive dilemma. The constructive dilemma is similar, again, right here. So the constructive dilemma, if we have P then Q, and we have R then S, what happens if we have P or R? All right. So in this case, what we're working on is the principle of the implication. All right. So if we have P, in this case, we have P or R, well, what's to say maybe we have a P? Well, what should we naturally end up with? We should naturally end up with Q. Or if we had R, what we should end up with, plugging it into this statement up here. If we have an R, we should naturally get an S. So if we have P or R, we should end up with P or S. And that makes up our basic nine rules of inference. And it's these nine rules of inference that we'll actually use to do formal deductive proofs, which you'll see in our next lesson.